Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Anthony Cave here with Faithful Sidekick Karma. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to talk about the loneliness, loneliness epidemic that we're hearing all about in the news from the United States Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy. What is this epidemic of loneliness that so many of my patients are struggling from? I recently had a patient who would come to my ketamine infusion clinic with terrible depression, loneliness, and isolation to a degree that was unfortunately very dramatic. They had had not only the loss of a family member, but also falling out from another family member. So like a grievance, bereavement, death, and also a falling out for other personal reasons. And after a handful of their first infusions, they said something to me that I want to share with you because it blew my mind. And I purposely did not use the C word, standing for connection, because I wanted to see if the experience would actually lead them to an uplifted state of being. They told me, they said, doctor, I felt like a fractal. When a patient tells me they feel like a fractal, this is very interesting. It's not uncommon when patients have an experience with ketamine. As you may or may not know, a fractal is a very beautiful geometric design. It's literally a branching-like pattern that occurs everywhere in the natural world, including in your body and karma's body, for that matter, everywhere in nature. You'll find this fascinating. Imagine a tree branch that branches and branches and branches and branches, where, for example, the fifth branch is the same as the second branch and the same appearance as the 107th branch. So every branch point is a different distance from the trunk, but it bears a strong, actually identical resemblance to all of the past branches and all of the future branches. So the patient is telling me that, that they felt like a fractal during their infusion. And I didn't want to use the C word. I wanted, I don't like to, I'm not playing games. It's not like a Socratic teaching moment, but it kind of is in some ways. I said, I, I, ex, I explained to them how that fractal is all over nature. It's in your alveolar branching. When you inhale air and oxygen, that branching of Airways to your lungs follows a fractal pattern. All the blood vessels in your body, like the veins that you see in your hands, these follow in some ways fractal patterns. Mountain ranges, deltas, and rivers all over the world. The natural world is filled with fractals. They're low energy states. And for physics people, that's why we see them everywhere. But after I said that, the patient on their own, their eyes lit up and they said, Doc, I feel connected. And that was their epiphany moment, certainly that day and for the days and weeks to come, because that was, an, that was a feeling that they felt that they could anchor onto for the coming weeks. And as of now, six months later, we still talk about feeling like a fractal and that immense sense of connection that it gave that patient and so many others, because like I said, these are not quite universal, but they're very common. So we're going to talk about today, what is the loneliness epidemic that affects more than 50% of United States adults or adults in the United States? What are some of the causes? And then more importantly, what are the three types of loneliness? Which types maybe do you feel and experience? And how do experiences like ketamine or other psychedelics or meditative states deep reflection. You don't need ketamine, of course, to overcome isolation and feelings of loneliness, but ketamine can be powerful in patients that are trying to heal from other conditions. And we're going to talk about that. And as you know, karma is here to keep us company <laughs> until she gets bored or until I run out of treats for her. So uh, if you wouldn't mind hitting that like button and sharing what you've learned with others, that would be much appreciated. You know that I don't like to do uh, product placement. I don't like to do any ads. I believe that this knowledge empowers you and those that you care for and love. And that is why I'm here today, not to try to sell ads for anything. So your support by subscribing or sharing what you've learned or hitting the like button is much appreciated. So 
Why is this loneliness epidemic such a big deal? Oh, and Linda, thank you so much. I really appreciate that very generous contribution and all of your kind comments and support. Um, and Tori Gore is talking about TMS. We can talk about transcranial magnetic stimulation compared to ketamine. It's a very interesting um, research debate at the moment. But first, let's talk about loneliness. There are many reasons, as you know, why loneliness has become so prevalent even before the COVID pandemic. Loneliness was becoming a huge problem that was accelerated by COVID. Working from home with COVID is not helped. The elephant in the room, as you know, is social media. And of course, social media can have very many positive benefits and some detrimental effects. I mean, we're using social media right now, so clearly there are some positive benefits. But these have confluenced together along with the physical ailments of COVID, the geographic distances that many of us now experience with work at home, et cetera, that have only compounded the existing problem. So what are the three types? Which of these, hopefully none, but if one, hopefully not more than one, resonate with you? The first is emotional loneliness. Emotional loneliness is kind of like what it sounds, right? You are heartbroken, you want to connect with someone else about why you're feeling any number of unfortunate uh, feelings or emotions. And oftentimes we say this is something that a romantic partner or a spouse can fulfill. Not There's, of course, many other uh, examples as well, close friends, family members, but emotional loneliness is the first type. The next type is social loneliness. And like it sounds like this are this refers to your connection with social circles. It is perhaps not by accident that affiliation with religious circles or groups or organizations or athletic leagues or intra, uh, intramural organizations, etc., has also decreased in the last few years. These are often sources of social connection, the lack of which can lead to social isolation. And the third is existential isolation. And this is a tough one, but is very important for understanding where ketamine plays into things as well. Because existential isolation or loneliness is a, a sense of loneliness that comes from not knowing your place in the world or your purpose in the world. You can have a romantic partner and good family and good friends and good social circles, yet still feel existential isolation. Many of my patients who don't have a sense of purpose, direction, meaning, fulfillment, etc., can feel existential isolation. Now, I should also say there are physical effects that are very serious with all of these forms of isolation. It's very important to recognize it, recognize these, pardon in yourself and in others. Heart disease, stroke risk are elevated so high that, heck, they are on par with the risk contributed to smoking cigarettes. They're not one-to-one. -one. Don't let anyone try to say, oh, loneliness is as bad as smoking 15 cigarettes. There's, there may be some gross similarities, but they are still different. I'm not saying that you should... Uh, that you can necessarily equate them one to one, but there is a real physical effect. In fact, it comes up under anesthesia in some ways. And you should see my video that we live streamed the other day from the operating room where I specifically shared some specific examples of how patients who are lonely can wake up under anesthesia or what they experience under anesthesia and how that can actually physically be quite different. But it's not just heart disease and stroke risk. The risk for dementia increases. And remember that we do not have any medications that can treat or prevent dementia. So anything that is lifestyle preventable or a lifestyle modifiable risk factor for dementia needs to be very carefully respected and um, hopefully entertained because once you get it, there is no turning back as far as we know. Risk of alcoholism, which can lead to a host of liver problems, heart problems, cognitive problems also increases with loneliness and depression can certainly be increased with loneliness and depression as we've talked about has very real effects on the body so loneliness can lead to depression which can lead to all these types of physical signs apparent under anesthesia and even not 
under anesthesia. If you're looking at other people, aside from them disengaging in social circles, one needs to be mindful that perhaps uh, if there are observable sleep disturbances, anhedonia, or what we call lack of interest in doing certain things, if they're withdrawing, not connecting, these are signs and others that you need to be mindful of, especially in those that we love and care for to help prevent loneliness from leading to these physical problems that I'm discussing or that I've shared with you. Now, how does ketamine help address loneliness? Like I said, I'm not encouraging ketamine to be used recreationally or in non-medically supervised settings. That's a whole different discussion that we're not talking about. But ketamine has very curious and very powerful effects that can, and I see, uh, Esavin says mushrooms. The psilocybin molecule found in mushrooms or that um, or the, psilocy the psilocin that can lead to psilocybin, both that are found naturally in mushrooms. Oh, Alexis, wow, thank you for that very kind uh, thank you there. Thank you, Alexis. That's very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, th that means a lot. It really does. Thanks. So ketamine and... Um, I guess magic shrooms is what Estevan is saying. No, it's not just a shroom. It's not just LSD. It's not just ketamine. It is not just meditation. It is collectively looking at the body as a whole. And the holistic approach towards any of these, which is what I do with ketamine specifically, very much legally and very medically sound, is what can allow, and that's karma hitting the desk there, by the way. That is what allows for addressing the three uh, really a handful, but three main um, aspects of loneliness. So number one, when individuals are suffering from emotional loneliness, we typically see a large overlap with major depression. When patients are severely depressed, it's hard for them to emotionally connect with others because of the inwardly focused perseveration and rumination that is unfortunately leading to a me, me, me outlook towards their life. I'm not blaming those patients, but I'm just recognizing that it is a barrier to emotional connectivity. Ketamine's ability to address the root cause of depression can allow an uplifting of the depressed spirit, soul, mind, heart, brain, whatever of those resonates with you, and they're all equally valid, I believe, to an extent. Wherever that depression lies, uplifting that can allow for a restored connection with others to address loneliness. Then there's social isolation. We know that anxiety, especially in the form of agoraphobia, can also be a barrier to social connectivity and lead to social loneliness. That was the other type we said, uh, social isolation. Agoraphobia and anxiety can also be addressed with holistic ketamine infusion therapy. In a relatively short amount of time, it does require holistic view of the human body, not just the ketamine, not just shrooms, or not just any of these. It does require a holistic view of the body, an integrated view. You're not just a bunch of chemicals in your brain. You're not just a meat bag walking around. You're a human being deserving of dignity, respect, and compassion. And if we're going to address the subconscious realm where your anxiety or depression or loneliness to an extent resides in, we need to address you with that full compassion, respect, dignity of the whole human being that you are. Not just push pills, not just push infusions, not just push random psychedelics. This is a mindful approach. And if you're ever seeking this type of therapy, please, please watch my other video on how to spot scams for ketamine infusion therapies or any types of ketamine therapies or quite frankly, any types of potential snake oil. You are a human being. You're not a product of human doing. Please do not let anyone cheapen who you are. You are a human being, not a product of human doing. Nor should you be, well, we'll leave it at that. The existential loneliness is also something that ketamine can address because when we lack a sense of purpose, of perspective, fulfillment, peace, some uh, people look for happiness. This can also prevent us from achieving that connection to the greater cosmos, the greater whatever you believe in, 
religion, spirituality, doesn't matter to me. I'm not, <laughs> but there is likely something that you will be able to overcome loneliness from if you establish or reestablish that connection. Ketamine, just like any psychedelic, can be powerful in this integrated approach to be able, hey, okay, I see you, Karma, I see you, I see you. can be powerful to help reestablish, re uncover a connection with a greater purpose. When my patients, whether in the operating room or in the ketamine infusion clinic, lack purpose, lack direction, lack perspective, who they are, why they are doing what they are doing. I don't want to get too meta or philosophical. I'm being very practical and tangi uh, tangible in the physical effects that these have on the body when they're lacking. By restoring this, ketamine can drastically help restore our sense of connection to overcome existential loneliness. So those are the three types by addressing addre depression, anxiety, or agoraphobia in some extreme cases. And that existential isolation, we can overcome so many of the cases of loneliness. Not necessarily all, but many. And by the way, this is not ketamine used every day like a SSRI or a Wellbutrin or some other daily anti or a daily antidepressant or daily anti-anxiety medication. This is a series of, like you know, in my clinic, six sessions of intravenous ketamine to hopefully last you for months, if not years, when done in a holistic model. Now, there's a couple other things as well. And um, empathy is one of them. When we lose empathy with others, we lose a sense of connection with others. And it's not by accident, perhaps, that many psychedelics, MDMA being the classic empathogen, but quite frankly, any meditative state, volunteering in your community, connection with others, maybe getting off of the computer. I know you're on a, probably a phone or a computer now watching me, but being able to physically connect with people can also help restore empathy, which can also address loneliness. Ketamine can also, it's been demonstrated and certainly in my clinical practice time and time again, we can restore empathy with these mindful approaches. And lastly, believe it or not, sleep disturbances can also unsurprisingly contribute to isolation. And these types of holistic therapies can also address sleep disturbances. Data is still coming out. But even if we're just, just addressing the depression, which can lead to sleep disturbances, treating the depression can address potentially the sleep disturbances, insomnia, et cetera, and then help reduce loneliness. It could be any other number of mechanisms. I don't know, but I know that it helps. And it can be very safe when done mindfully. Wouldn't you agree, Karma? Yeah, she agrees too. So I hope that you appreciate just how much power you can have with or without ketamine, but with respect for who you are as a human being. Sure, as a patient, there are other labels, man, woman, whatever, but you are a human being worthy of that level of care towards yourself and from your doctor. And please never forget that you have more power to heal than you've probably ever been told. And you probably have more power to help heal others than you've ever been told. I'd like to answer some of your questions now, but I hope you all do feel empowered to take control of so much of your health that you can control in the communities that you live in. As always, hitting that like button, sharing with others goes a long way to help me do this more often for you. And if you subscribe, you can help keep, uh, keep up, or you can keep up with all of these live streams. And maybe you can see Karma and Mochi more often as well. Um, oh, MW, thank you for that, um, that, the thank you note there. You say that my tonsillectomy was during COVID. I had surgery without family being there. My cousin, an anesthesiologist, held my hand before surgery. MW, thank you for addressing that very, very important point. When we're in the operating room having surgery, which by the way, I hope your tonsillectomy went safely. Let me lower this so you can maybe see Karma a little bit more. She's like, yeah, <laughs> that's the doggy. People say we look alike. I don't know if you really think that. Do you think we look alike? Do you think so? Anyways, no distractions. Uh, MW, when we are in these vulnerable, vulnerable moments and we are not surrounded by trusted individuals, so it's like a surgeon we've never met or not met 
um, appreciably well before. Scrub techs, hopefully not too many representatives from drug reps or um, device reps, your anesthesiologist, nurses, whatever. When we are in these foreign environments with unknown individuals, this can increase the risk of medical trauma or increase the risk of other bad outcomes from happening. They're not guaranteed, but this is why, as you know, I call my patients the night before surgery so that we can establish that connection before they come into the operating room. And during COVID, this was the policy everywhere where we wouldn't let loved ones come in. There's a time and a place for certain precautions, perhaps, but at some point, we do have to recognize the risks and the benefits of these policy decisions. And my heart has continues to go out. There are still some places that are limiting the number of family members allowed. Uh, Mochi came by my feet here. Let me just grab her for those of you who have not seen Mochi in a while. Here she is. Um, Karma's chasing her down there, so I figure I'd lift her up and give her a little bit of reprieve. Um, thank you for sharing how kind your cousin was holding your hand before you fell asleep, MW. Very touching. Snowflakes, someone says, are fractals. Yes, they are. You're correct. Would it help with trigeminal neuralgia? Ketamine might help with that, but there are other treatments that I would first investigate before um, just going straight to ketamine. Uh, Catherine Quintero. Oh, here comes karma. Uh, here we go. Oh, yeah. There they are booping each other. Uh, <laughs> It's a zoo. Oh, hi. Hi. Hey, baby. All right. Let's get a couple more questions in here because you're asking such powerful questions. Um, Alexis, I'm happy. <laughs> insomnia, Linda. Thank you for asking. Ketamine may help with insomnia. It may actually help with sleep disturbances um, during the perioperative period. We are still gathering data, but if we can address depression, anxiety, and other known risk factors for insomnia, we may be able to address the insomnia by addressing those root causes rather than grabbing uh, sleep aids the way that Gen Zers are more likely to grab sleep aids. And that's a whole other video topic we'll do. Okay, there you go. Bye-bye, kitty. And karma is, yeah, karma is just karma. Thank you, Linda, for that great question. SJ Forrest asks, can ketamine help autistics with connection? I am an autistic adult who has had a tough time letting people know me. SJ Forrest, thank you for your vulnerability in sharing that. That's not easy. Thank you. Neurodivergent conditions or autism, A ASD, are not well studied in terms of how they can improve with ketamine. I don't want to comment on that. I'm not aware of good data to support that. However, there are still times when a trial of ketamine may be reasonable it does depend on your doctor, the system that you're operating in, and uh, other variables that you would want to talk to your doctor about. Very good question, SJ. Nabita Seta, or Nabet Seta. Hello, everyone. Alex Cole says, Ambient has saved my life. And Alex, you're showing a really powerful point here. Sleep aids can serve a purpose at a certain point in time. However, when they are used excessively, out of context, they might be detrimental. By the way, here is karma. Still here, just a little bit off to the side. But Mochi's gone. Unfortunately, she went to the corner. My concern does come if sleep aids are used excessively, especially benzodiazepine classes, because of the risks they have, especially for the elderly. For the elderly, they can be particularly problematic. Fall risk, risk of delirium or dementia, et cetera. So, I'm very happy that they have been helpful for you, Alex. I hope that they continue to be helpful for you and don't cause side effects. Of course, ambient is not a benzodiazepine. Um, Linda, uh, <laughs> I will put my keys in the cabinet. I don't know what that means. Sorry. <laughs> Michelle Green, I'm a social worker. I work with individuals who have antisocial personality disorder thought, uh, disorder, antisocial personality disorder. Ketamine for that. Another very good question. Michelle, I'm not aware of good evidence for ketamine specifically for that personality disorder. Antisocial personality disorder, however, has many other contributing variables. I don't know if we can say that people are just born with an antisocial personality disorder. Some likely are, many are probably not. If there are underlying contributors towards that personality disorder, 
Ketamine may be able to address those. I suspect it can in many individuals, but it's heavily dependent on the holistic delivery of it, not just putting people in a room, connecting them to an IV and walking away, which is how many, if not most, ketamine therapeutics are delivered, which I don't believe is responsible. Very good question. Um, Alexis, thank you again for the kind comments. Auntie Handmaid, at what age do I consider someone elderly? That's a very good question. There are some numbers that we go by 65, 70, 75. A better number in some cases is frailty. Frailty is one of these things where it's like, you know it when you see it. We don't have a good definition for frailty other than the gradual loss of physiological reserve, meaning that your heart doesn't have extra capacity to beat as much. Your brain does not have extra capacity to be as cognitively active as much, et cetera, et cetera. Frailty can occur at any age. We like to employ lifestyle modifiable or lifestyle behaviors that help push frailty to as far as possible. Things like, heck, owning pets can be helpful. We know Mediterranean diet, Mediterranean lifestyle, physical activity, social connectiveness, et cetera. Loneliness can certainly distract or detract from our health span and make frailty creep in earlier. Very good question. Um, Zephyr Hills says, crazy. That is exactly why I won't do it. Zephyr Hills, what are you referring to, I wonder? Um, Jumping the World says, what is considered old? I think we just talked about that. Very good question. Um, last couple questions here. Oh, Heidi. Um, always good to see you, Heidi. And, and of course, your work with special ed students. That's fantastic. And it looks like uh, Steph Barber is also a former special ed student. Well, Steph, I'm sure you appreciate Heidi's hard work. Senso, thank you for that very kind um, thank you there. How is having surgery on local? Are there more neural connections during? How is having surgery on local? What is that, uh, Senzo? I have to ask you to reword that. Do you mean having surgery under local anesthesia versus general anesthesia? Please, um, if you could clarify for me, I'll tell you what I think you, you mean, which is, do we have more synaptogenesis or neurogenesis or neuroplasticity with local anesthesia? or sedation versus general anesthesia? It's a very good question. We simply don't know the answer, but when we are giving ketamine, I often use ketamine more for cases of sedation. And this is a whole topic in and of itself. Um, this is fascinating. I've had patients wake up from sedation where they have received ketamine and report a couple of weeks later that they are still feeling their depression and anxiety uplifted. So even during minor surgeries where local anesthesia is heavily used and maybe some light sedation, such as with ketamine, can promote even those increased feelings of connection, decreased depression, et cetera. Uh, I had a patient specifically who told me that with their colonoscopies and endoscopies, they received ketamine and they felt better for several weeks afterwards. So to answer your question, potentially there could be more but there may also well be neuroplasticity with other forms of anesthetics. You really don't know yet. And unfortunately, if you're getting general anesthesia, it is likely for a major surgery and the inflammation from that major surgery might undo the majority of the neuroplasticity benefits that perhaps the anesthesia provided. Whereas local cases or surgery with local anesthesia are typically much smaller with much less whole body, or what we call systemic inflammation. So there's multiple confounding variables. Very good question. Josiah says, I have autonomic dysreflexia. What signs do you look for under anesthesia? Josiah, the blood pressure and heart rate are big ones. And if the patient is under sedation with like a spinal, for example, mental status, a blistering headache can be signs that we need to be very mindful of. Something that we have to take very seriously because of the potential lethal effects if there is a sympathetic storm from that autonomic dysreflexia. Very good question. We have a new M Marilyn Schultz, new here. Very good. Please tell me, does depression and loneliness affect a person coming out of anesthesia? Marilyn, we're going to end with your question because it is so powerful. Yes, lone actually you should watch the episode I did the other day from the operating room. Patients who are lonely 
are at risk of having certain bad outcomes after anesthesia and surgery. It depends on many factors, but the moment some patients see a mask like this, this can be a trigger for more inwardly focused rumination and perseverative cycles that consume us in ways that can distract us from a healing mindset before our surgery and after we wake up from anesthesia. Anesthesia itself might interact with your body differently, in particular if you're taking medications for depression or anxiety or maybe even intense anxiety in and of itself, especially if that's a contributor to your loneliness. Our sense of purpose in having the surgery in the first place is so vitally important to shaping how our recovery after surgery goes. It's like you're in a boat and you're getting ready to leave the harbor. If your mindset is focused on why am I even in this boat, why am I in this port, and what is my direction from this port going to be after the surgery, these are how we prime our mind and body because of that vital mind-body connection to entering a healing environment during our surgery and after, more importantly, after our surgery as we're recovering, to hopefully recover with the most positive mindset, which absolutely impacts the rest of the body. Infection risk, frozen joints and other complications, blood clots, the risk of acute pain turning into chronic pain. These are all examples of things that can be worsened or can bad outcomes that can happen when our mindset is not in the right place such as falling asleep with immense anxiety and even that sense of loneliness. Great question. Everyone, I wish you uh, such a great rest of the weekend. Please remember that you have more power over your health than you've ever been told, and your support helps me do this more often for you. And just sharing what you've learned with your loved ones is such a powerful way of helping others empower themselves and be advocates for themselves in the broken healthcare system that we unfortunately live in. Until next time.